can y'all hear me back there? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. 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 Implementing a lot of different things, and y'all that actually get out on the floor and put these things into progress have done a fabulous job. Um, our scores have continued to rise. Years ago, we were low to bottom pretty much, and we've got some scores that are already hit the ninth percentile. Some that are working their way up there. But we came across, um, Sheila came across an article. We started thinking about what more can we do. We're just kind of at that lull. We're, we're kind of stuck. So we started looking at things. What can we do to get people back into it, get people involved, start making a difference, um, and bringing those scores up? Sheila found this article and brought it to the committee, and it was it really pumped our, our interest. Um, it got us thinking about getting back to where we came from. What brought us all into healthcare? How did we get here? Most of us joined healthcare with the desire to comfort, to heal, to help people. Um, and some of these things that we put into place, you know, they're mandated, we have to do them. And it gets us so lost into, we've got to do this, that we sometimes forget about why we're really here. <laughs> we still have to do those things and we do them well. But we want to remember that there's a patient laying there, there's a family sitting beside the side. And that little bit of extra going, you know, for that patient, for that family, uh, recognizing them, acknowledging them can make all the difference in the world. So um, in this article, um, this is by Gary Hamill. It's about a hospital similar to ours. They came up with the same issues. They were doing all they could and still couldn't get quite over that hump for satisfaction. Um, and he kind of refocused the thinking. And I'm going to read you something in here that he said that I liked. Um, he talks about hospital visit is one of the most emotionally charged events <coughs> any human being can ever experience. Something that is remembered for years afterwards. Uh, he kind of breaks it down into three phases. First, there's admission, typically accompanied by pain, fear, and anxiety. Next is the inpatient care, often involves alternating bouts of discomfort and boredom. And then last is discharge, when the outgoing patient feels unprepared and sometimes even abandoned. Um, so what we're looking at is just challenging everyone to bring a little bit more of themselves into that room. You know, uh, every time you interact with a patient, telling them who you are, what you're there to do, but then bringing into a heartfelt, why are you there to do it? Um, and the way they went about doing this was trying to learn a little something about the patient, learn a little bit about their family. Um, so we came up with this program, or it's our Caring Hearts campaign. You'll see these posters put out, and um, these were actually designed by Jessica. So good job, Jessica. Um, they'll be up on the walls. And right now, this is Bob Birchfield. He is Systems Director for Behavioral Services, um, but he's also a fabulous motivational speaker, if anybody has ever heard him. Uh, so he's going to talk to y'all a little bit about bringing your heart back. Well, thank you. Well, uh, I really don't have anything prepared, so just kind of hang in here with me. Oh, oh, I did bring a 46-slide PowerPoint, just in case uh, a speech breaks out. Uh, no, hey, thank you all for letting me come. Uh, Kelly, thank you for inviting me to come. And, uh, one of the things I love to do the most, uh, one of my, the best things I get to do for Baptist is I get to come and speak and do different things like this because I'm passionate about nursing and I'm passionate about patient care and I'm passionate about uh, the ministry of Baptist. You know, all of us could work somewhere else doing something else, but something got us here. You know, I'm a pastor um, and um, I tell people that Baptist is just my part-time job uh, because the full-time job is ministering and, and uh, I just do this for the health insurance. So, man, if, it, if, they, if they keep increasing the price, I don't know. Uh, I might be out on this one. I might be from the Obamacare or something. Uh, no, uh, you know, I'm here at Baptist because I believe in the mission of Baptist Health, and I believe in uh, what, what God wants us to do through this ministry. And so one of the things I always do is I always open up in prayer. 
uh, because, you know, we've got to give God's props. And we are who we are because God is who he is. So if you'll just join me in prayer for a second. Heavenly Father, God, I so thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for, Lord, for this ministry, God, that you've allowed us to come be a part of. And I pray, God, now, Lord, just for the next few moments, Lord, that we set aside our agendas and our, our thoughts. Father, I pray, God, that we, Father, for these next few moments, God, that we are just all the way here. Lord, we do have concerns. And, God, we've got things and distractions. Lord, that's one of the reasons why we're talking this morning. Uh, Lord, because of the, uh, of the distractions, God, that sometimes knock us off course. And I pray, God, Lord, that we push the reset button, Lord, if we need to. Lord, that we, Father, would uh, be uh, rejuvenated, God, if that's what needs to happen. I pray, God, Lord, that we, Father, would be reminded of why we're here. And I pray, God, Lord, that we would give our, you our very best. And by doing so, God, we give the patience that you send here our very best. Lord, may you be glorified, Father, by everything that we do and say. Lord, may you be glorified not only by who we are today, but, God, that you be glorified by who we are to become. For certainly, God, we are who we are because you are who you are. Lord, we are lucky and thankful and fortunate and blessed to be able to serve you in this very special way. So, God, I pray now that you'll just equip us. And, Lord, that, that these next few moments, Father, would be enriching, encouraging, Father, and exciting as we, uh, as we are reminded, Father, that we, Father, are caregivers. And we touch the lives of those that you send here. Lord, let us do our very best. And, Lord, may we please you in the process. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm a funny guy. Of course, looks aren't everything, but, you know, I, I like humor. And so uh, I've, I've got a couple, of, uh, a couple of jokes. And if you'll go ahead, I don't know how we're going to do this because the, the clicker doesn't work. Um, but uh, I'm just going to tell Kelly to very slowly go to the next slide. Oh, no, please, take your time. Oh, here we go. Uh, Life is the best medicine, which is fortunate since uh, that's all our health care plan now offers. Uh, well, laughter is the best medicine. Uh, keep going. Uh, one of my favorite uh, Proverbs is Proverbs 3125 says, She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. You know, if we serve the Lord today, we get it right today, we can laugh at tomorrow. You know, the, the future is just a string of nouns. So what we do now is very, very important. And, um, and, for, and so for these next few moments, I, I want us to to really begin to not only process but inventory, but turn that spotlight on ourselves and say, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And am I in the place where I need to be? One of, and for me, uh, laughing at things and enjoying things, uh, that, that puts me in the right place. And so bear with me, we'll have some humor th uh, th this afternoon, but we'll also have some, some probably hard hitting stuff too. Uh, next one. Laughter is the best medicine except for treating diarrhea. <laughs> It means nothing. I just thought it was funny. So, all right, next. Here's an elf talking to a nurse. Uh, elves and nurses do have something in common. We, uh, we all do the work, and one guy in an oversized coat gets all the credit. <laughs> Can I get a name in, right? All right, next. When I asked if she was critical, I didn't mean verbally. Um, you know, and trust me, half my patients are like the lady. Nurses are like, thank you, Lord, for the patient is leaving AMA. <laughs> next. And those three words every girl wants to hear, I love you. The three words I want to hear, alert, oriented, and independent. <laughs> oh, this one here. It says, I keep hitting escape, but I'm still here. You know, a lot of times, uh, isn't, that kind of, isn't that kind of sometimes what you feel like? I, I keep hitting the escape button. I, you know what? I really want my world to change. I want my culture to change. I want, I want my unit to change. I want how we deliver care to change. And I keep pushing escape. And you know what? This is one of those buttons that we're pushing today, right? We're trying to push a, an escape button. We want to get to where we used to be. You know, and that's kind of where we find ourselves. We're not where we used to be, but we're not quite yet where we're going to be. We're somewhere in between. So in that between stage, what are we going to do then to get to where we're going to be? Uh, well, uh, <coughs> <laughs> you know this guy here. I mean, look, pan this guy Gallup survey, right? Just see what his scores are going to be. Uh, or better yet, pan his patient uh, press gaining survey and see what see what they say. You know, before we get to this this point in our in our nursing or healthcare career, um, I think we I think I think we owe it to the patients, and certainly don't we owe it to ourselves to make sure that that we're giving our very, very best. Before we get to that point, we're just going to break. You know, I tell people uh, all the time, you know, I can boil water with just a spark. Now, that water's got to be at two, 211 degrees, but if that water's at 211, any little old spark, and that thing boils over, right? Maybe you know some people 
that they're, I mean, they just stay at 211. Man, they are just so stressed out. And I don't care if they get cut off on the interstate or they get cut off in the Walmart line. Man, they're just going to boil over. Can I get a witness? Anybody know that? <laughs> well, because they just stay at 211. They just, uh, I mean, their world is just jacked up. If they had a happy thought, they'd beat their head against the wall until it went away, right? And we all know people like this. And you know what? Sometimes we're kind of like that. But just because of life events, just because I come to work, I don't stop being a father, I stop being a husband or a brother. I don't stop uh, being a pastor and having all the things that go along with being all of those things. Life happens. And when I come to work, I carry all that with me. Now, I can also, though, carry all the good things that make me me into work. And before I become this kind of nurse or this kind of health care provider, I think, I think I need to make sure that I'm doing what I need to do in order to remove all the static and all the stuff and make sure that I can move forward with a clear plan, a clear understanding, a, a good understanding, a better understanding of why I'm doing this. Okay. So, best thing to do, I was going to sing. I've rethought that now. <laughs> You're welcome. Next. Um, oh. Oh well. Um, I, I know what it says. I wrote it, so I'll just tell you. Uh, basically, there's this interference. There's this static that comes in. There's these things. You know, um, one of my favorite knock knock jokes. You, you want to hear it? <laughs> knock knock. Hippa. Hippa. Okay, I really can't say anymore after that. <laughs> Listen. Think of the things that interfere with how we do care, right? I mean, we, we, uh, we, have, we have HIPAA, oh my goodness. Uh, I don't know what demon spawn brought that thing together, but, um, but we also have, you know, we, we have payer uh, mixed stuff, and we've got, we've got interference with, re I mean, we are regulated to death. Now, we have uh, publicly reported things so that we can be, you know, I don't know, uh, compared to the heart hospital that's, that's got a, you know, a two to one staffing ratio or whatever. And these things begin to, we begin to have interference. And the things uh, we have, we're so specialized and, and we get so many things thrown at us that sometimes, wouldn't it be nice if you could just come to work and just take care of patients? Wouldn't it be great? Well, you hit where you're aiming. If you aim for chaos and calamity and bad stuff, you will hit it because it's out there. I tell people in my church all the time, purpose to bump into your blessing because you know what there are blessings all around us and you hit where you're aiming if you aim for blessings you'll hit it they're there there's good stuff the Bible tells us in Philippians 4 8 you know if you're in my church I say anybody want to quote that for me um, I'll say that because I always mess it up so. uh, but basically for, and I won't quote it because I'll mess it up but it will tell you Philippians 4 8 says that whatsoever things are good and noble and of good report righteous holy pure uh, I'm adding some words in there, but you know, you get the gist, right? If it's a good thing, think about that. Because you know what? There are bad things that are going to happen. There are, there, there's static and there's interference. There's all that stuff. And you know, if we focused on that, then okay, guess what happens to our day? It gets staticky. It gets full of interference. We start to stumble through things and, uh, and things don't look as good. But if I begin to focus on all the things that we're doing right and all the things that I can affect and all the changes that I can make, and purpose to bump into those blessings, guess what? It gets reinforced over and over of the good work that I'm doing. Next. So, let's get started. All right. Here's the, uh, the, the Sistine Chapel. I won't bore you with all the details, but it was a big deal. When Michelangelo, who was, by the way, a sculptor, not a painter, was asked by the Pope to do this thing, he said, okay. I guess he was a Catholic, whatever. So he began to paint. Next one. So he, he began to paint the Sistine Chapel. No, this isn't true. This is a lie. He didn't do it on his back. <laughs> Urban myth. Sorry. Uh, it's only, it's, but by the way, this is about the only picture of Michelangelo you can find. Uh, but he painted the Sistine Chapel, but it was painstaking. He, uh, it was a labor of love. It took him several years to complete it. Um, next. So when he got through, here's, a, here's one of the ceiling panels that he painted. So the ceiling looked like this, but guess what the floor looked like? Next. This. Can you, now can you picture him? Here's Michelangelo, he's painting, painting, painting. Okay, and there's this beautiful masterpiece in front of him, and there's this hot mess below him, right? 
So what's the difference? What's the difference? Because it's the same paint. It's on the same palette, right? Red is red and blue is blue. And one, one speck of red, one stroke of red, looks like a masterpiece. Another one looks like a mess. You know the difference between, between a, a masterpiece and a mess? This next. One more. Is that one determined to stay on the brush and the other didn't. See, it, as a Christian, God is painting a masterpiece through me. I think he's getting the short end of the stick, but whatever. And you know what? He can do this because he's the master painter. He is the master of everything. And he uses us as his children, as his servants, to go do these things. And if I stick in there with him, if I hang in there with him, if I stay on the brush, guess what? I get to be a part of that masterpiece. I get to be a part, if I do my job right, and I come to work, and I, I think of others better than myself, and I do what I can do to affect the health of this patient, whenever they go home, Bob Birchfield is a good memory. It's a good thought. I mean, you know what? He did things he didn't have to do. He, you know what? But the most of what I do, I don't do because I have to do it. I do it because I want to do it. It's kind of like speaking today. I'm not here because I have to. Trust me, if Kelly has asked me, hey, you want to do this? I could have said, uh, deuces, no, not going to happen. And I would just stay in Little Rock and do my thing. I'm here because I want to be here. Just like you, you're here because you want to be here. You can be working anywhere else. You can be doing anything else. But you want to be here. So that's the difference between those who, who are part of the, the master plan and the masterpiece and the, those that are just part of the hot mess on the floor. All right, next. Um, I love this, this, uh, this thought. Veneg is broken from an outside force, life ends. Veneg is broken from an inside force, then life begins. Create, great things happen from the inside. See, it's not about the things that happen to us that matters. It's what happens in us that matters. You know, the Apostle Paul, I won't preach at you. That's a lie. I won't preach at you. That's kind of what I do, too. Um, the Apostle Paul was talking about, he said, you know what? Outwardly, I'm wasting away. Man, outwardly, I'm, I'm, I'm tore up. I'm old. I'm decrepit. I can't see things like I could. I used to. I can't walk like, you know, I just broke down. I get sleepy and tired. I get hungry, you know. Now, on the outside, hot mess. He said, but on the inside, I'm getting bigger every day. On the inside, I'm getting better every day. See, it's not about what's happening to us on the outside. Because you know what? Cruddy things happen to us on the outside. There's parts of our story I wish it were written differently. There are parts of my work day I wish looked a whole lot different. I'm, I'm with the nurse with a woohoo, AMA, oh, you know, yay. Doesn't matter. I can't, listen, I have very little effect of the script that plays out around me. But what happens in me? Now that's what matters. Listen, uh, there's some bad things that will happen to us on the outside. It doesn't have to change us on the inside. See, when life does this, we don't have to do this with it. When life does this, we really can do this, can't we? We don't have to let our circumstances affect us. Now, sometimes we do, right? Because we get, we get all upset. We get, we get emotionally charged. We get all, all uh, kind of unraveled with our circumstances. I think the challenge for us sometimes is to say, you know what? I'm not going to let these, I'm going to anticipate that these circumstances and challenges exist. I'm not going to determine, let those determine my day. Next. So it's a personal choice. You have to decide what you're going to do. You're going to remain in the game or are you going to change course? We're here to, today that we're going to stay in the game and together we're going to change course that's going to affect a better change. Next. Some days I feel like this. Top of the world, baby. I got it, right? Woohoo, doggies. Other days, feel like this. Right? And, uh, these are all physicians, by the way. These first seven are physicians, and then those, the rest of those are middle levels. Right? And then there's a hospital administrator right there on the end. Right? Um, some days, listen, I feel great. Some days, oh, man, could I buy a break? No, I don't think so. Next. So how we stay on the brush? Take one day at a time. Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. says, Christ said this, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You take each day at a time. Just wonder, you know, when I walk into work in the mornings, um, as I'm walking in, I, I pray the same prayer, God, let me die to self. You rise up in me today, and you nurse these patients, and you lead my staff, because you know what? I can't do it. See, God knows me. He's, I'm, I'm transparent, and he knows what I'm made of, because he, he made me. 
And so he knows, I can't lead anybody. Trust me, I've tried. Well, I can't preach. Um, tried that too. Back when I was like 19 or 20, I was just kind of starting. And um, I preached a sermon. And it was the coolest sermon ever. It was uh, the so sermon. Well, that's not uh, kind of prophetic. Um, because, you know, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16. So I got up there, it was on Sunday night. But it was one of those days that you didn't really know how to dress because it was like ice cold in the morning. It was screaming hot at night. And it was in the evening. So someone's going down. So I had this wool sweater. Apparently, that's when I found out, allergic to wool, uh, just kind of a side note. <laughs> and I was up there in the front, and I hadn't prayed to this sermon at all. I was just up there. I was just going to speak, you know, that long. I had like 16 different definitions of the word so. You put that before love, man, it just changes the whole idea of what love was, and it was just mind-blowing, and I was going to be the most brilliant thing ever. So I stood up there, no Bible, John 3, 16, handful of notes. So I stood up there. Well, as I stood up, I thought, huh, where are my thoughts? They just drifted on out. I'm like, mm, okay. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 19. I'm, woo doggy, I know everything. And that's why I noticed the red wasp. It was at the back of the church. It was kind of ambling its way up the thing. And it kind of came up. And I, was, I was focused on that wasp because I couldn't <laughs> read my notes. I was looking at it. And it went straight up to me and went pop <coughs> around the neck. Uh, oh, my lance. This thing just stung me on my neck. <laughs> so I had to have this moment in front of everybody. I hadn't preached a word yet, right? I've already been stung by the wasp, who I think is the hand of Satan. Well, then that's when I got instantly hot, and then that's when the rash broke out because apparently my body was challenged with the stress of the wasp thing. And then I just broke out in this full body sweat that then quickly turned into a full body cramp. And so I looked at my notes and thought, well, I'm just going to start preaching now because they were looking at me like these old ladies were I said, I said, you know, John 3, we all know John 3, 16. We all know it. And I thought I was going to say it. And I thought, well, what's the first word? I don't know. I've got a stain on my, stain on my neck. And, um, and so finally, uh, this lady in the back, she stood up. She just, she just stood up and read it. Oh, bless you. She was like an angel of God. And so I looked at my notes. And then they were like snakes swirling off the page. Well, maybe it's the, the venom in my neck. I don't know. Anyway, I just stammered around. Truly, I stammered around for like 10 minutes. That was my big so, so that's my big moment of being so cocky and so arrogant. That's when I realized I can't preach a sermon either. I can't do anything aside from what God lets me do. Period. And so I'm not arrogant. I'm not arrogant enough now to not start my day with God let me die to self. The Baptist doesn't want Bob Birchwell to show up. Uh, Baptist wants the new, improved, God-ordained Bob Birchwell to show up. And so that's what I do. Uh, and I hope that you're a believer, and if you're not, man, come see me after this. This isn't an evangelism thing. Uh, but, uh, but this is what I do. And, and, this, and I, know, I know this about myself. And so this is, this, is, this is my process. This is me planning for success. And I love this scripture. I'll take one day at a time. All right, next. Love this picture because this is a typical, a typical day for me uh, where I can't say no. One of the reasons why I'm here today, I just couldn't tell her no. It's not because I really didn't want to be here. I did want to be here, but, you know, uh, just keep saying yes. Okay, okay. And it's kind of in healthcare, you're compelled to say yes, right? You're paid to say yes. You're not paid to say no. I don't care if pharmacy comes and says do this, okay. If the doctor says do this, okay. Joint commission says do this, okay. Health department says do this, okay, right? At, at some point, you're just, all of your hooves are off the ground, right? <laughs> and we feel overwhelmed. Now listen, the, uh, next slide. We could, we could go this route, all right? On those days, you ever had those days where you just start putting things down? Just don't push sin, okay? <laughs> Helpful hint on that one. I can speak from experience, but there's a lawsuit that says I can no longer speak about that. All right, next. Uh, I have no idea who wrote this poem, um, but it reminds me of, of, of my days. Because it says, it says uh, it's not always the red flag crisis days that are the hardest to take. It's the oatmeal days, the ordinary zero days of little or no consequences. The ho-hum days filled with nothing of any particular interest, colorless, uninteresting, unfascinating, unspectacular, and unfun. The days everyone deals with. We cope, we wind our ways through the tangle of tedious activity, and sandpaper people scattered throughout our day and get no applause because coping is expected, we just carry on. 
The God of the crisis time is the God of the oatmeal days too because he said he is, because he keeps his promises always, because we can't get along without him and because we wouldn't want to if we could. You know, there are some days that are great and I mean, we're, I've got our sleeves rolled up and we are doing lots of work and we're doing all kinds of things. We go home thinking, man, I conquered something. And then some days you go home and you think, well, it's just an ordinary day. Can I just tell you, by working in a hospital, your, your ordinary day is something extraordinary to the person that you're reaching in that hospital bed. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a usual thing to come into the hospital. Um, it's an extraordinary thing to be here. And for us, we clock in, we know the place, we get around, we do what we do, and it's just an ordinary day. It's extraordinary to them. And guess what? I didn't wake up in their world. I woke up in a pretty good world, been married almost 31 years to the most wonderful woman. She is wonderful. Um, she's put up with me for almost 31 years. And um, I get up in the morning, I got breakfast, I got my iron. I'm, okay, my clothes are laid out like gar animals. You put this, I do not put this, this, this together. If I look sharp, it's not because of me, trust me. Left alone, hot mess. Uh, but the world I wake up in the morning, my wife is singing, she's, uh, she's cooking, she's cleaning. She's barefoot and pregnant. No. Uh, I wake up in a pretty good world. My kids are great. I'm telling you. I'm not testing God. Please don't test me on but, but I have a pretty good But you know what? I didn't wake up in a hospital bed this morning. I'm not facing tests. I'm not wondering, is it cancer or is it not cancer? When is my husband going to go back to work? Is he gonna, ever going to get to go back to work? How are we going to pay this hospital bill? Can you imagine what our patients are going through when they wake up here? Or the ones who come in for labs. And we think, well, it's just routine labs. Well, it's not routine to them. They're, they're wondering, what are these labs going to say? Do I, do I make it or not? Is my life going to be OK or is it not? There's a lot of things going on, a lot of moving parts coming on. And sometimes I have to be reminded that my ordinary day, God is a, the God of my ordinary day. But guess what? I'm interfacing with somebody who's having an extraordinary day, and he's their God too. And guess what? He gets, God gets to use me to help be his hand of healing and his hand of comfort and his shoulder to, of strength. See, that's a good thing, isn't it? And that's why we're here. So anyway, I just like this, this, this poem. So three things. Um, this doesn't really show up that well. Uh, by the way, Meerkat's pretty popular on uh, Google Images, just saying. Uh, they're hilarious. You can never get enough Meerkat. <laughs> um, if we're going to do this, knowing human nature, I've been working with psychiatrists since 85. Um, I know human nature. And I know what makes us tick to a point. But I, I think that, that if we can nail down a couple of things, I think we can start to avoid some of the pit, uh, pitfalls, and some of the things that keep us from having that, that red banner day. The first thing is just not to compare ourselves with others. Now, I like this guy here. You really can't see his eyes. He's cutting his eyes at this guy because he's thinking, he's, he's driving. You probably can't tell that either. He's thinking, I'm a better driver. Why do you have the wheel? Right? How many times do you think as humans that we do that too? We think, uh, listen, I'm one of those people that I'm at home watching the Olympics and I'm thinking, I could do that. No, I could not do that. I could do it better. Than, I mean, how hard could it be really to, to, to do that iron cross on those rings? How hard could it be to swim? To swim, I swim. I can do that. Michael Phelps, move over, son. I, I got this. I can swim. I'm a pretty good swimmer. I got long arms. I'm built for it, kind of. I float. <laughs> How many times do you think that we think that whoever's in the driver's seat, pff, I'm better than they are? Can I get a witness? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> but when we start comparing ourselves to other people, can I just tell you something? Here's a little secret. There's somebody better than you are out there. Now, there's somebody worse than you are, but there's somebody better. It, there's, that's just the dynamic. I love you know, going down I-30. How come is it when we're driving down I-30, people who drive faster than us are maniacs, and people who drive slower than us are crazy? Thinking, because at any point, I'm either driving faster or slower than somebody else, right? Uh, when we start to compare ourselves to other people, if we look hard enough, there are those traits that we won't measure up. So do you just want to have a Hallmark crying moment, or do you want to just move on through life and accept the way God has, has made you and placed you where he's placed you? Uh, next one. Because when we compare ourselves to others, um, it won't be too long before, before you and your, your buddy is in the, 
is in talking to the supervisor, you know, just duking it out. I saw that, I thought, man, if that's just not something that I catch on a daily basis with my squabbling people, <sighs> can you believe so and so? Listen, there's more than one way to, to, uh, to skin a cat. I was gonna say meerkat, but then that's just been bad. You can do it more than one way, it's okay. And just because something you've done it for years doesn't necessarily mean that's the best way or the worst way. Your way, if it, if it, if it gets the effect and gets you to where you need to go, whatever road you take, it's okay. If it's safe and it's good, it's great quality, all that good stuff, right? All right, next. Um, this is me in kindergarten. The, uh, the, uh, my, my daughter, Anne Marie, She's a senior in high school, plays for Benton High School. She's gonna sign her letter of intent to uh, Arkansas Tech on Wednesday. Woohoo! Four years of college paid for. Money in the bank. Um, but a couple years ago, we were coming back from, for, uh, and by the way, my, my daughter, she's 6'4 with her shoes on. She's 6'3 without her shoes on. Apparently that's important. So she was, uh, so she's pretty tall, but she's pretty good at, at, her, at her, her position. She's more than just tall. Uh, she's good. And she was playing uh, AAU ball, and we were coming back from some tournament. She had a great tournament. That was a tournament that Duke University called her and got her transcripts from Benton High School. They were, they were in at that point. That's how good of a game or good of a tournament she had. Duke University, um, going to Arkansas Tech. <laughs> you, know, what, you know what happens when you, when you keep your kids close? They don't go to Duke University. <laughs> they go to the closest, best school that they could possibly think of which is Arkansas Tech, which is good. Um, but we'll come back, that's a, I mean nothing. I really should have notes, because then I would stick with them. <laughs> Bottom line, so we'll come back from, the, from, from, from this tournament. And Anne Marie, who had a great tournament, did a great job. She said, I'm not as good a ba basketball player as Jessica. I said, well, yeah, you are. No, let me tell you something. Jessica's pretty good. Uh, she's, uh, she's going to a D1 school. She's already signed, uh, or she's going to sign uh, Wednesday for another D1 school. Jessica's really good, um, but she's point guard. And she ain't like five foot nothing, about 100 nothing, and she's tiny, quick as grease lining. I mean, she can do it, she's like a Harlem Globetrotter with that ball. She can put it anywhere. Now, Anne Marie is like, doo -doo 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 -doo. She, you know, she tires over everybody. We come up, I mean, strong, she can strong. Uh, now, Jessica, she can't come very strong, but man, she don't have to. I mean, she's like, where's that flash? Oh, it's just Jessica with the ball, didn't miss a beat, right? And because she couldn't handle the ball like Jessica, and we think, well, she's a better ball player. I'm just not that great. See, when we compare ourselves to other people, we forget that one of the aspects is that we're all created differently. And we all have different skill sets. And I told Anne Marie, I said, yeah, but she, she does something that you can't do, but you do something that she can't do. She can't, she can't block the shots that you can block. She can't, she can't do uh, what you do under the basket to get the rebounds and make those shots to post up and be strong. So we all have our jobs to do. And every one of us in here, um, to look around, we've got about every department in, in here uh, represented. And you all have your jobs to do. And one job isn't more important or less important than the next. I had a, uh, a, an ES worker, true story. Um, it's almost like when a pastor tells you a true story. Uh, last Thursday, she came to my office, Victoria. And so I'm in there, she said, Mr. Bob, you need your, uh, your, your trash changed? I said, no, I'm good, Victoria. And then she plopped down on my, on my couch. So, okay. Uh, I looked up from her. She said, Mr. Bob, I'm depressed. I said, you are? Why are you so depressed? She said, I just have low self-esteem. I said, well, well why do you have low self-esteem? She said, because I'm an ES worker. And um, she said, I tried to be a CNA, but I, couldn't, I, I just couldn't do it. She said, and all my friends, they're... They, one, one finished pharmacy school and one finished nursing school and one of them's an LPN. She came back to her and she said, how come you're just still working in the ES? She said, Miss Bob, I'm trying to do my, my very best. I said, well, Victoria, your best is good enough. As long as you're giving your best, that's good enough. And I said, uh, she said, I don't even like hospitals. Said, but this is the only job I can find. I don't even like them. Um, she said, um, she said um, they, they, they make me depressed and, and people are hurting. And she said, I just don't like it. And uh, here I am working as an ES. I said, well, Victoria, have you stopped to think about your role that you play here? Don't you think that everybody who comes here doesn't want to be here? Don't you think every patient who, want, who is, we, that find themselves at Baptist Health, that they don't like the hospital either? But you, in your small way, 
are helping make that a better stay. Somehow, some way, their stay is better because of what you're doing. I said, could you imagine us trying to run a hospital without ES? I said, listen, what you do isn't any more or less important than anybody else. I'll take the physician and stack, them, stack you up next to him every day because no one is more or less important. We all have a job to do. That's why you don't compare with other people. Listen, I have a twin brother, identical twin, uh, big buck, works over at UAMS. And um, we're identical in just about every way, and, uh, except we have different fingerprints. Thank goodness, because I think he's a thief, I'm pretty sure. Uh, one of these days, one of these days. Uh, which means we can be identical in every way, except we've got our own, we're individual, we have our own fingerprints. You are who you are, and God has made you who you are and how you are, and he's placed you in this place. So don't, why would you go compare yourself to other people? Why don't you ask God, okay, God, what do you want to do with me today? And let me do my very best, and guess what? Your very best is good enough. Number two, don't compete. Listen, competition, I get it. We can compete between departments for Gallup scores. And all, that's great. We can do that. But when we start to compete against each other as, as workers, as staff, as caregivers, um, things start to break down because, uh, because competition means that there's a winner and there's a loser. Uh, you know, whenever um, I play football, I would run. We'd run these wind sprints. We'd run. Well, I had to, of course, listen, nobody was expecting me to win any wind sprint, but they were expecting me not to come in last either. All I had to do was stay ahead of the guy who was beneath me in, my, in the depth chart. I was number one, and the number two guy, he had to make sure that he was, I, I, I had to stay ahead of him because if, if he ever beat me in a wind sprint, then I become number two and he becomes number one. I think that's what the coach used to keep me mot motivated. Uh, now, I used to hate wind sprints. I'm like, man, because at any time, if I, don't, if I don't hit everything just right, all of a sudden I lose. Well, I went in the Army, and boy, we did a lot of running. Any uh, military people in here? Okay, anybody? Thank you for your service. Um, I was Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, I was in the Alpha 2 2 training, and um, I was a 9th Training Command out of Barcadelphia. So, uh, and when I went to base training, I had no idea what to expect. I knew it was going to be grueling, I knew it was going to be uh, uh, very physical, and it was. But one thing I didn't uh, expect was that there really isn't any competition. You know, when we, we did a lot of running, but it wasn't that if I ran, I had to beat the guy next to me. In the Army, all we had to do was all just show up at the same time. And so, and so that, whole, that whole heavy burden of trying to be number one, it was just relaxed. And so then I got to where well, I kind of liked running. It, was, see, it wasn't the running that I didn't like because I finally started running marathons. It wasn't the running that I didn't like. It was the competition. And it was that I've got to strive because my value and my worth is only as good as me being number one. Well, guess what happens if we work in a place where we don't compete? When we accept each other for their good stuff and for the bad stuff and understand that as long as we hit the finish line all at the same time, then we all win. So we're all as strong as our weakest member. We finish this thing together or we don't finish at all. Um, I believe that and that's how I treat my staff, is that we're only as good as our weakest member. The Bible says this, those of you who are strong ought to bear up with those who are weak. There are some days when I'm really strong and will bear up with that weak person and guess what? Because of a skill or because of something, um, tomorrow I might be that weak person. You know, in nursing, um, the, anybody here a good stick, IV stick? Who's, who's, who's our good stickers? You're a good stick? I know, it's like, it's, that, that's like the holy grail of nursing. Man, if you're a good stick, oh, well. Uh, I'm a pretty good stick, believe it or not. Working in psychiatry, I'm a pretty good stick. Uh, um, I used to get called, oh, no one else could get it, so let's call Bob. Woo well, I'm here to save the day, you know. I just want to kind of do this <sighs> kind of thing, right? Um, guess what? If you're not a very good stick, who cares? I bet you're awesome at uh, helping families go through tough times. I bet you're awesome at making sure that your, your patient and his pain level or her pain level is really good. See, there are things that we're good at and some things that we're not so good at. And so if we start to stack people up based on some of the things that we think are important or we think are valuable, we're gonna, I think we're gonna miss the boat on this one. Right, next. 
So every patient, every time, when one succeeds, we all succeed. All right, next one. Then number three, don't complain. It's, e it's easy to see what's wrong. Let's look for us for I love this, uh, this comic. It says, this summer we decided to stay home and complain. <laughs> uh, you know, the, you know what, what makes it so funny is because there are so many people who live their life like this, aren't they? They, they just, it's like, what do you have to complain about? Now, again, like I said earlier, you hit where you're aiming. If you, if you aim for complaints, you'll find it. But if you, uh, if you look, begin to see all the good things around and begin to focus on those, it's different, right? All right, next. So quit looking for reasons to be offended. I love seals. They're, I mean, they're no meerkats, but they're pretty close. Now, every seal looks the same with their mouth open. Look, they look offended, don't they? It's amazing. Look at a picture for a seal, they always look offended. Look, oh my gosh. All right, next. Hmm, wonder what they're thinking. Next. Oh my gosh, he didn't even speak. <laughs> He's just walking out. Of right, just looking for reasons to be offended. Okay, the next one. Hey, just walking to the nurse station, do some charting. Next. Oh my gosh, why is he sitting in my chair? Right? <laughs> now, there's, there are things that, about our day that we can just invent reasons to complain, can't we? Uh, it's too hot in here, it's too cold in here, it's too bright, it's not too bright, right? Uh, and we just, it's amazing how we can invent things. Life could be so much better. A lot of our chaos and complaining, it's man-made. And we just should just stop it, right? All right, next. So if you treat everything like a life or death situation, you die a lot. <laughs> kind of like, kind of like Sanford. All right, next. So plan for success, next. You don't have to know every step, just your next one, as long as you know where you're going. In, in our field, we kind of want to know all the steps, don't we? So we have a treatment plan, and we have every step in that treatment plan laid out there, right? And so sometimes we get in our mindset that if we don't know every step, well, then it's going to be a failure from the, from the get-go. It's not going to work. It's not going to fly. We don't know every step. We've got to have everything taken care of. Well, that's not how life works. Could you imagine if your car, when you turn your lights on in your car, that it went around all the way down the interstate and turned right there off the exit and then went down and went straight to your house, and then you could just kind of go in the light? Okay, well, that's stupid, right? It only gets you right to where you're going. As long as you know where you're going, you just need to light the path the next, the next little bit to make sure you're not going to hit an obstacle. But we give our cars more credit than we give ourselves. You don't have to know every step. You just have to know what your next one is. If you know what your next step is, then take it, right? And you know what your next one is, well, you take that one too. If you keep putting one foot in front of the other, you finally get to where you're going. And I think that sometimes we get overwhelmed because the, it gets so big. You know these big tidal waves that come and wipe out whole cities? These big tsunamis that come and they just do all this damage? You know, every tidal wave is made up of little bitty drops of water. Every one of them. Uh, I've researched it. Um, <coughs> Every tidal wave is made up of drops of water. You can dismantle the biggest tidal wave with an eyedropper. It would take you a while, but you could do it, right? Like every problem, if we would break it down to its elements and its issues and begin to break it down to what can, and you know, because we all have this, this circle of influence, these things that we can have effect over. Am I doing pretty good on time? You know, I'm a preacher. My bad on that. Uh, we have a circle of influence. We, can, we, have that, we, have, we have influence on certain things. With my, listen, I've got a son that's 25. He's kind of moved out of my circle of influence. I'm kind of into the partnering stage. I don't know how I feel about that, but that's where, I'm, that, that's where I am. My daughter's 17. She's still in my circle of influence. If I say be home at 10, she better be home at 945 or she's grounded, right? It's my circle of influence. There's a lot of things that I, in my circle of influence, but can I just tell you, most things in my life are outside of that circle of influence. And those are the things that drive me crazy. Listen, do I want the economy to get better? Yes. And I just fret about that. Do I want to, uh, ISIS to go away? Yes. I fret about that. Do I want uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Republican Party to, to get through their stuff and the Democrat Party to get through their stuff? And I, I won't preach about politics. It's a little divide the room. But all the stuff that gets, gets, gets thrown at us, how much stuff are you fretting about that really is outside of your circle of influence? You can't do anything about it except for fret. So you have a personal choice. You can just choose to trust in the Lord. Because here's, here's where we are, the palm of God's hand. It's where we are. 
That's where, that's where, that's where I am. Hope we hope there, you're there with me. It's a big hand. Um, either he's got it or he doesn't. Either I trust in him, believe in him, or I don't. So I just trust and I believe. And so that's where I'm at. And that's what I and and with those things that are inside my circle of influence, I will affect those things. And if everybody would do their part, as we come together, we begin to make change uh, throughout the system. All right, next. <coughs> so, you're a nurse. What a, what a wonderful thing to be. You know, we're talking about why, why is this campaign so important? Because it gets us to the point where we just get rid of the static. And we push aside all the things that don't matter. Um, there are some things that matter. And we're going to focus on those. And we're going we're to get better at that. But a lot of the things that are man-made, all the interference and all the regulations, all the things that make us go, Ugh. put that aside. Put in a pigeon. Know that it exists. It's part of, part of health care. But you know what? It's not a part of why I'm here. I got into nursing. My dad um, passed away when I was 18. And when I was, I don't know, six or seven, I began to regulate his, his blood sugar. Uh, back in the day, you regulated blood sugar, put some urine in a test tube, and you put the little pill in there. Remember that? And you shake it around, and you do it next to the bottle. <laughs> And uh, we had MPH U80 uh, and MPH U100, and he would get two shots uh, of that. And then I would regulate his, his blood sugar as like six or seven. That's what I, that was my job. Um, and he lost his legs whenever I was in junior high. So, that, so being a big guy, and he wasn't very big at all, I'd pick him up in the evening. I'd pick him up. I'd put him in the shower. I'd scrub him. You know, I'd take him out of the shower, get him dressed, and put him in his lazy boy. Did that until I went off to college. Uh, he passed away my first semester in college. Um, that gave me a passion to help those people. God made me a big guy with a strong back. Uh, and uh, and I det I've determined that God wants me to help people. See, there's a reason why you are where you are. And at some point in your career here, somebody looked across the desk and said, you're who I want on our team. After we've looked at everything and we've assessed all these players, we said, you know what, you're what we're looking for. That's a good thing. And, and nursing, nursing happens to be for me, and I chose nursing to, to be the healing hand of God, to, to do no harm, to be a shoulder to cry on, to do what he wants me to do. And I don't have to worry about all the ifs and ands and whys and all the other stuff. I just have to do the very best I can with whatever's right in front of me. If I do that, everything will change and everything will be okay. Next. So I'm going to finish with this. You're going to want to write this down. If not, I'll just email this to you. Here's my motto right here. This is what we'll finish with. Next. Handle stressful situations just like a dog does. If you can't eat it or play with it, just pee on it and walk away. <laughs> Listen, I hope. Isn't that cool? Listen, it's going to be okay. Don't make up extra stuff to worry about. God has got, God's got our back, and he's got a plan for us, a plan to prosper us, not to harm us, a plan to give us the hope of the future. That's a fact. Uh, and if you need to push some things out of the way to get back to where you began, let me just implore you, it's not only as a pastor, but also as your friend and as your coworker. Push it aside. God's got so much bigger stuff for us to worry about and to do than this petty stuff that we put up with every day, right? Well, that's all I got. Thank you all very much.
We have a few things that we've done. You'll see these posters throughout the hospital when we get done with this. Um, we've got these pledge cards here. Um, we'd like you to each write down an idea, a suggestion, how you would think you might be able to show your compassion, show a heartfelt connection to one of your patients. Um, these pledges, uh, we will put in huddles, uh, with or without your name, that's a, just a context before we put your name on it, if you want your name on it. Uh, Vicki's going to do a drawing, we're going to have a drawing for those. Uh, we have shirts that we've got, I know everybody loves t-shirts. Uh, I really like these, Sheila came up with this design. It has all the things on it that we're here for. Um, hope, support, friend, compassion, uh, nurturing, commitment, all those things bring to our patients and to this hospital and to each other. Um, there's going to be rounds from administration uh, in all departments <coughs> and supervisors and what we're going to do is kind of just stop and ask you have you made a heartfelt connection today and if so tell me about it. What did you do to make that connection with your patient and if you haven't what could you have done um, and then when you do that uh, we started out with thinking about stickers. You know, we all love, we just love weighing our badges down on one more thing. Um, so we looked at stickers, um, and that's still an option, but I also have another idea. I've got to run the first. Um, but as a different thing that you can add to that will be on your badge as well, but it's a little more prominent and will actually prompt your patients, I think, to, to ask you, so what does that mean? And, that might prompt them to talk to your the person that's rounding and say, hey, you know what they did for me today? You know, something just as simple as that. Um, we've got snacks. We've got all kinds of things for you today. We just want to make sure that everybody um, is really into this program, and I think we can make it a, a very big success. Um, I'm going to close my part, and then if Sheila wants to come up and say anything, uh, Maya Angelou, I'm sure most of you have heard of her, she had a quote that was, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I think that's something we should all remember when we're going into a patient's room. And not that's just the patients, visitors in the hall, visitors in the waiting room, people in the coffee shop, just anybody that might be here. I think if we make that connection, that's what they're going to remember. Sheila, did you? I almost forgot to. Let me add this real quick. We also have these getting to know you signs. Um, you'll see these in the coming days. Uh, Baptist had actually already kind of started a program similar to this. We're going to either laminate these or put them in some kind of way that you can write on and walk them off. Um, but they just asking simple little things about your patients so that the next person that comes in can call them by maybe a name or a nickname that they prefer to go by. Bring up a pet, say, you know, talk to them a little bit, make that connection with them about them, not just why you're there. Well, I just want to first of all say on behalf of environmental services, don't go around peeing on everything. <laughs> <laughs>
fun with it, and I think it'll all just everything else will just fall into place if we get back to the basics. So, do you have any questions? And we'll put out some times when you can wear these shirts to work, um, and then also, you know, what will happen. At